Hello there, welcome once again to Stewards of the Manifold Grace. My name is Joseph Bimbo Akinjokun. We'll be continuing in our series, Impact That Cannot Be Ignored. And today we'll be looking at the life of Abraham and the lessons that we can draw from his life. He was a man that made an impact that the world is yet to recover from. God said it clearly in his promise unto him that through him all the families of the earth will be blessed. Everyone that is a child of God today is also a seed of Abraham. So if his life is that significant, it means that there are a lot of things that we can learn from it and that's what we're going to be examining today. And it's my prayer that this teaching will be a great blessing unto you in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for the privilege to go into your word and learn at your feet again. Let your word come expressly like a barbdaro, like a guided missile, straight to our areas of need to bring illumination and direction to us that we may be who you have called us to be people of impact on our generation in jesus mighty name we have prayed amen praise the lord now the story of abraham begins with god telling him to leave his land to leave his country we see this in genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3 the Bible says that God has spoken unto Abraham, telling him to depart from his kindred, from among his family members, from among his nation, and go to a land that he will show him, and that he will make of him a great nation, he will bless him, he will make his name great, and he will be a blessing at that place. The lesson we can learn from this is that the divine purpose of God is always geographical location specific bible describes us as the planting of the lord that we may be that he may be glorified it says we are trees of righteousness the planting of the lord that he may be glorified and as a plant it is not in every kind of soil that you can be planted for example there are some plants that can do very well in the tropics if you take them to the temperate region they will not do very well even in the tropics, there are some plants that will do very well in the rainforest. And if you take them even to the savanna, they will not do very well. Why? Because that location is different from the one that they require for them to flourish very well. It is the same with you and I. Where God wants you and I to operate, where he wants our purpose to find expression is always specific it can be that specific all through the cause of us trying to fulfill that purpose and it can be what he wants us to do per season but location geographical location right now is very important if you are going to fulfill the purpose of god for your life it has to do with you, the city you live in the country that you are in it, excuse me it can go as far as even the environment, the neighborhood you, neighborhood you live in. It can impact on the kind of workplace that you decide to offer your services to. So location is very, very important. God told him specifically to leave where he was and go on to a place that he would show him because where he was was not right enough for him to fulfill the, fulfill the purpose of God for his life. God doesn't just give territories to people. He gives the territories that he has earmarked for you to you. That's why God told Israel, Israel not to touch any of the portions of the Ammonites, of the Moabites, of the Edomites, because he said he was not going to give unto them as much as a foot's breadth. Why? Because that was not their portion. So, purpose is very important. And in fulfilling purpose, you need a divine location that God will order your steps into. We're going to be looking next at Isaac. But it is worth mentioning that God also told Isaac clearly that he should not depart from the land that he had planted him in. We see that in Genesis chapter 26 from verse 1 to 5. God said, don't leave this land. Remain in this place. And it is in this place that I will multiply you and make your name great. And I would make you a blessing unto your world. 
So location is extremely important. Like I said, it can be something that will be throughout the course of your life. Like in the case of Abraham. And it can be something that will move with time. God told, um, uh, uh, sorry, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. God told him, don't, as in go and stay at the brook of Cherite. Stay there. And while he was there, God sent all the supplies that he needed unto him. But a time came when the brook dried. God did not tell him to continue to pray that rain should come. The same God that was making ravens to bring him water. I'm sorry, to bring him meat every day, twice a day. That same God told him to remove himself from that place and go to another place. He said, I have commanded a widow woman at Zarephath to sustain you. And he therefore had to relocate from that place to another place. Joseph could not have fulfilled his purpose if he had remained in his father's house. He needed to go to Egypt. And that was why God orchestrated his brother, selling him into the land of Egypt. Because that was where God had ordained that his destiny will find color. So location is extremely important. Ask yourself, are you where God wants you to be? Are you in the city, in the neighborhood? Are you working with the company that God wants you to work with? It has nothing to do with how much money you are making. Are you in the purpose of God for your life? If you are going to make the impact that eternity will reckon with, then you need to locate your divine position, your divine placement, your divine location, so that you can fulfill God's purpose for your life. Every resource that you need will come to the place that God wants you to be in. When Israel was in the wilderness, everything they required was coming to meet them right there. God sent quails and those quails came and met them in the wilderness. God released manna from heaven and the manna located them in the wilderness. Where you are is where the supply that will help you fulfill your purpose or sustain you in the course of you fulfilling the purpose of God for your life. It is in that place that those supplies will come and meet you. Therefore, take time out and locate where God wants you to be. Praise the name of the Lord. The second thing we see about Abraham is that he was a man of prayer. Several times, Bible would say that Abraham raised up an altar unto God. We'll see at different times where the Bible will talk about Abraham interacting directly with God, pouring out his heart and hearing the heart of God as well. That means he was a man that was given to prayer. He was interested in knowing what the mind of God is part time and doing that thing. When he had concerns, he knew how to point out to God. When he needed supply of help, of grace, he needed that he knew who to go to. And when he went to God, he was always getting direction. Some of those things were not always the things that he wanted to hear, but they were always the things that were relevant to his purpose and the destiny that God had ordained for him. So it's important that you live a life of prayer. What you need to fulfill God's purpose for your life is more than what this earth can supply you. And that's why you must need to establish a time, a habit, a culture, a lifestyle of constantly interacting with God so that you can draw from his abundant supply of divine resources and then be able to fulfill your divine purpose. You cannot fulfill divine purpose with natural strength. You need divine resources to fulfill divine purpose. That's why you need to spend time with the source of divine resources so that you can have access to it and then fulfill the purpose of God for your life. So Abraham was a man of prayer. He knew how to leverage on his relationship with God and draw on divine resources. And that was why he could make the impact that the world has not been able to recover from. 
we need to be men of prayer. Jesus Christ said in Luke chapter 18 verse 1, he says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Prayer is important. Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, says that without faith it is impossible to please God. And he that must come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently see God. For you to believe that God is, that must come to him, for you to believe that God is, it means that you need to acknowledge that. And the way you acknowledge that is in the place of prayer. So you need to spend time James was telling us in James chapter 5, I think verse 16, about um, how we can make impact in our world. He said Elijah was a man of like passion, just like we. He said he prayed earnestly that there should not be rain, and for a space of three and a half years, there was no rain. And he prayed earnestly again, and then God caused the rain to fall down. And he says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. One version says that the prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. And it is this power that you need to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. That's why he says that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ever ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. So we need to be people of prayer, spending time with God in the place of prayer so that we can draw divine resources and fulfill divine purpose. The third thing about Abraham was that he was a man of peace. He wasn't the kind of person that would want to do anything or cause trouble for him to have his way. When there was a dispute between his herdsmen and those of Lot, he sought a way to resolve the matter peacefully. Being people of peace is extremely important if we're going to fulfill the purpose of God for our lives. Many of us are so giving, I'm talking about Christians, children of God, we are so giving to strife that people find it difficult to connect with us because when they see us, what comes to their mind is that that troublesome man is already coming. If you are living like that, how can you impact people positively? The Bible says that we should do everything in our power to be at peace with all men. Jesus Christ in the Beatitudes says that blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God, which means Peace, the ability, the desire to always make peace is one of the things that identify us as children of God. In fact, after love, I believe that our commitment to peace is one of the things that show that we are truly children of God. Abraham was a man of peace. He wasn't always looking for trouble where there was none. He wasn't looking for reasons for strife. He was ready to do whatever it would take for him to dwell at peace with people. Apostle Paul even tells us that sometimes we should allow ourselves to be defrauded, to be robbed. I'm not in terms of defrauded, in terms of somebody taking your money and you're just looking there and you're not doing anything. That's not what that means. It means sometimes allow yourself to be cheated by people. That's why he said that if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, turn the left. That's why he said that if someone constrains you to carry his cloak one mile, he said go two miles. That means go the extra mile with it. Do the best you can to pursue peace. So that on the day you decide to make war, nobody will blame you for it. So peace is extremely important. It is our identity. The Bible calls Jesus Christ the Prince of Peace. And he did the best he could to be at peace with people. 
Even God, reading through the book of Jeremiah, you will see at, at, at every point in time, he would send prophets so that the children of Israel can be reconciled back unto him. His first response to their wrong was not always for him to judge them. He was always finding a way for he and them to be at peace. It is when they, re they reject the way of peace, that is when judgment comes upon them. So we should be people of peace, establishing the peace of God upon the earth. Praise the name of the Lord. Now the fourth point may seem contradictory to the third one, but it is not. Abraham was a man that also understood the place or the importance of war. David said, I'm a man of peace, but when I speak, they are for war. As children of God, we must understand that while it is extremely important for us to live a life of peace, that must be our attitude, a life of peace. That must be our pursuit. But there comes a time when we need to make war. And at those times, we must not back down. When the time comes for us to confront the enemy, we must not back down. At a time when they were carrying Paul to the place where they were going to uh, persecute him, he spoke out for himself. He used the law to defend himself. He wasn't out to destroy the people, but he knew how to fight for himself. The Bible even tells us that we should fight the good fight of faith. Abraham, when he heard that the people in his uh, house, as in that his nephew had just been kidnapped and all the things raided and had been taken captive, he took people from his household and they went and they made war. In fact, the Bible says that those people in his house were people who he had trained, which means even in the time of peace, he prepared them for war so that when war came, they were ready to make it. And they went and they fought the battle and they won it. So we need to understand that there's always a time to make war. Jesus Christ says clearly to us, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That was a statement of war because you don't overcome if you don't fight. He says that you may overcome all the powers of the enemy. You don't overcome if you don't fight. You don't trample by sitting down and folding your hands. You must confront the enemy. Speaking concerning the children of Israel, the Bible says that we shall speak with the enemy at the gates. That's part of the blessings of Abraham. So there's always a time for war. And when those times as in, show up, we must not back down. The Bible says in Philippians 1.20, it says, And in nothing be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. That's why we have weapons of war. It's called the armor of God. The sword is not for decoration. It is for confrontation. It is for assault. Hallelujah. So we need to understand that and Prepare for war. The Bible says that we should not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 3 says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Weapons of our warfare. Weapons are not the same thing as ornaments. Weapons are for warfare, not for decoration. So we must know that as Christians, we need to make war. Abraham made war when it was necessary. And therefore, he was able to get the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. The other thing that we can see about Abraham is, is that he was a man that understand the value of relationships with people. In fact, one of the reasons why he allowed Lot 
to go ahead and choose the portion of the land that he liked was because he wanted to maintain that relationship. He said that we are kinsmen, we are brethren. There should not be strife amongst us. Why? Because he was a man that valued relationship with people. He saw that as very important. The reason why he went and fought and brought Lot back was because he valued his relationship with Lot. The reason why he interceded for Lot was because he valued the relationship with Lot. Interestingly, in the book of Genesis chapter 14, the Bible says that he was confederate with the people in Mamre. So Abraham knew how to establish, establish relationships. Those people were part of those who followed him to go and fight the war to rescue his, cousin, sorry, his nephew, Lot. We see this in Genesis chapter 14. He was confederate with those of Mamre. So you need to know how to relate with people very well if you're going to fulfill your purpose. Luke chapter 2 verse 52 concerning Jesus says that he grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. So it wasn't that he was just spiritual alone and he was just relating with God alone. He also increased in favor with men. So we need to know how to build capacity in how to socialize, how to relate with people correctly because we are social beings. God wants us to interact with our world and there is no ministry, there is no impact if it is not about others. So we need to understand that there is need for us to form valuable relationships with people if we are going to make meaningful impact in our world. Praise the name of the Lord. The sixth point is that Abraham was a man that was contented. He wasn't a covetous man. When he went and fought that war and took things back from the people who took away that Chedolama, when they took away the people of Sodom, that's Lot inclusive. He fought that battle, conquered those five kings, and then brought everything back. He could have claimed those things for himself, but because he was not a greedy man, he said he was not going to do that. In fact, he stated it categorically to the king. He said, take all your things, oh, because I don't want it to be said that you are the one that made me rich. Many of us, just because we have done a little good for people, we want them to pay us back. We want an enrichment from them. That is not what God wants from us. We need to be people of service who hold on to the fact that God can reward. If you notice, when Abraham said, I have lifted up my hands unto the most high, that I would not take anything from you, lest you say you are the one that made me rich. Abraham put his trust absolutely in God and God did not shame him. In Genesis chapter 15 verse 1, God responded unto him by saying, I am your shield and exceeding great reward. Which means whatever reward you think you should have gotten from that, but you decided not to get, I will surpass it. Let me be the one to reward you. Some people will pray for someone and just because they have prayed for someone and that person has gotten maybe the breakthrough or the deliverance or the healing, they want them to pay them. They want them to pay them. They say it is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving to who? To you? Let God be the one. Everyone that Jesus Christ healed, yes, he wanted people to give thanks to God, but he wasn't saying that they should pay him, they should come and give things to him. Yes, people should be taught thanksgiving, but it should be thanksgiving to God. People appreciating God for what he has done using us. This was the mistake he hasn't made. And that was why he got leprous. Understand that the reason why, um, what's his name? Uh, Elisha did not receive that because he said that it was not the time to receive 
of course people give things to him and he receives we can see that clearly in that second Kings chapter 4 verse 42 when a particular man came from Bashalisha and brought corn and all manner of things to him there's a time to this man not a time to this but you don't demand People are to give freely and cheerfully. Not that once you have been a blessing to somebody, then you demand. No. That is covetousness. And that is not the way God wants us to live. Hallelujah. So God wants us not to be greedy people, not to be covetous people. Abraham was not covetous. He trusted God and God rewarded him. Hallelujah. Number seven is that Abraham was a man of faith. We saw his faith clearly exhibited in the way he obeyed every instruction. One key proof of faith is your obedience to the instructions and the commandments of God. If you are not obeying God, you don't have faith. Abraham obeyed God when God told him to get out of his father's house and go to the land that he will show him. Abraham obeyed God when God told him that he should let Ishmael and Hagar go. Abraham obeyed God when God told him that he should not return to the land that he came from. And he commanded his children to do the same thing. Abraham obeyed God when God told him at the age of 99 to circumcise himself. That would not have been an easy thing to do. But he obeyed God. Are you walking in obedience? There are three major proofs of faith. The one that is most relevant or the one that shows that you obey God directly, the one that God sees as proof of your faith is obedience. Yes, to others, it is your steadfastness. To you yourself, it is rest. But to God, it is obedience. So if you claim to have faith and you are not obeying the instructions of God, Check what you call faith. It is not faith. Hallelujah. It is not faith. It is you living in assumption. Hallelujah. The eighth is that Abraham was a man that valued his family, his children, the generations that were going to follow him. God always wants us to do things beyond our generation. Bible says in Malachi chapter 2 verse 15, he said he made them male and female and he gave them the residue of the spirit. Why? Because he seeks a godly seed. He seeks a godly seed. If you are the type that does not think about the future generation, you cannot make impact in your world as you are supposed to. Because you may be surprised that the legacy that you have built, the generation that comes after you will be the one to wipe it out. That's why God said in Genesis chapter 18, when he was going to Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, why is it that we hide this thing from Abraham? Since I know that he was going to become a great nation and that he will command his household to keep my commandments and to obey me. He was a man that did that. He made sure that his children were taught the ways of God. He made sure that his children understood the commandments of God. He made it a lifestyle. So if you are going to have an impact, that is why when they are talking about deacons and pastors in the Bible, the prerequisite for how they will emerge is that the man should have his house in complete subjection to him, his children. He must be type that has authority and must teach them. He says if the man does not rule his house well, that he cannot be productive, effective in the house of God as a leader. So the way we treat our family is very, very important because posterity is very important to God. The ninth point is that Abraham was a man of wisdom. There were two major things that he did that struck me. The first was that when Sarah died and he asked for a burying place, 
The people say, ah, we love you now. Don't worry. We don't, there's no need for you to pay for it. Just mention the place that you want and it's yours. Abraham understood that it went beyond, that thing is going to go beyond him. Now that burying place is going to go beyond him. And what did he do? He decided that he was going to let his, as in the payment, full payment be made for that place. So that his children would be able to lay claim on it. If it had been a gift unto him, chances are that if there's disputes between his children and those people's children, they could decide to claim it back. And we saw that in Genesis chapter 26. Because those people came and the wells that he dug himself, they took it from Isaac, his son. So imagine if he had not paid for that place, they could have taken that burying place for him. He said, no, I don't want it free of charge. Let me pay for it. We must be very careful about freebies. Abraham was very careful about it. And that is wisdom. The second thing that he did was that he understood that the one that was going to be his heir, according to the law, according to the instructions, the word of God, was going to be Isaac. And what did he do? All the children that Keturah had for him, about six sons after that, he sent all of them packing away from Isaac when he was still alive. He put his house in order when he was still alive so that there will not be any crisis that will cause problem. If you think that was a small thing, go and study the life of Gideon and see how the wife of a, sorry, the, the, the child of a concubine came and wiped out 70 of his children. 70. Why? Because he did not put things in order before he died. It was the child of a concubine that came and destroyed all of his children. So it is extremely important that we act in wisdom. We must acquire wisdom about the way to live today and about how to ensure that our children have a peaceful time when we are no longer here. Hallelujah. Lastly, it's very important that I mention this, is that Abraham was also a man that was given to making mistakes. So the mere fact that you make mistakes does not disqualify you from being used of God. Sarah suggested, why not go in unto Hagar? She's my maid. And then whatever child she raises will be our own. She decided, as she gave that suggestion, and Abraham obeyed without asking God whether he should do that or not. And that nearly caused problem in his family. He made that mistake. But did that disqualify him from being used of God? He learned from his mistake. And that was why he didn't take any wife again while Sarah was alive. And after Sarah died and he took another wife, he made sure that he sent the woman's children away, like I told you. Why? Because he learned from his mistakes. You will make mistakes in the course of this journey. If anybody tells you that you will not make mistakes, that is a big fat lie. You will make mistakes. But when you do, Make sure you learn from them. That is the wisdom in it. It is important that you... Abraham made mistakes and he learned from his mistakes. And he was a man that made an impact that even the world is yet to recover from till today. I believe you have been greatly blessed by all of these things that I've been telling you. Go back, look at these 10 points and see how you can make necessary adjustments in your life so that you can be a person of impact in your world. It's my prayer that the word of God will strengthen you, will build you up and cause you to be able to fulfill the purpose for which he has created you on earth. And you will leave an indelible mark upon your generation and the generations to come will praise God because of the kind of life that you have lived. Let us pray. 
Thank you, Father, for the privilege you have given unto us to interact with your word again. Thank you for the light that has come to us again. Let his word continue to transform our hearts, bringing changes in our behavior, in our thinking, in our reasoning, until we are transformed into the image of your son, becoming who you have ordained that we should be. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you very much once again, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. God bless you.